dear Sangha, it seems like only a few days ago that uh, the Education Committee uh, sat together to decide on the Dharma talks for the RAINS retreat. And I thought, oh, this talk will be a long way away. But now it's not a long way away anymore. In the uh, discourse on the eight realizations of the great beings, we read the sentence, um, the mind is always searching outside of itself and never feels fulfilled. And it seemed that this is the, the way of our mind. And we have learned that it's possible for our mind to stop searching outside of itself to come back to its true home in the present moment. One of the obstacles is not being able to dwell in the present moment. Today I would like to look at some of our ancestral teachers about whom we have heard during the Rains Retreat and how they, they managed to practice um, being fulfilled in the present moment, fulfillment in the present moment. The Buddha said that the mindfulness, the practice of the, the four establishments of mindfulness is the, is the one way that can help our mind uh, not to be carried away to come back to the present moment and to touch nirvana. And we have the practice of the 16 exercises of mindful breathing to make it very easy for us to practice the four establishments of mindfulness. Many of my uh, younger sisters uh, tell me that they, they just enjoy practicing the first four breathing. And one time, one uh, <coughs> young brother uh, told Thai that every time he practiced sitting meditation, he would practice all 16 breathings in one session of sitting meditation. And it seemed that Shaom said that is not correct. <coughs> I don't know what what further instruction Shaom gave to that young brother. I have to admit that sometimes in one sitting I, I do practice all 16 exercises of mindful breathing. But uh, I don't suggest that that is a goal that we give to ourselves you have to, in this sitting meditation, you have to practice all 16 exercises. 
No, I don't think it's like that. But when the all 16 exercises, they come easily and naturally, then it's okay if you, in one sitting, you practice all 16. We know that uh, when we begin the practice with the, the, the verse, uh, in, out, deep, slow, calm, ease, smile, release, present moment, wonderful moment, that we learn that we begin with in, out. We just recognize in, out. And only when we recognize that our breath has quite naturally become deeper and slower, then we will go on and we will practice deep, slow. That is a very natural transition. Sorry. That is a very natural transition that takes place between in, out, and deep, slow. It's not you say to yourself, oh, now I'm going to practice uh, deep, slow. I'm going to make myself deep and slow and you make an effort. No, your breath has quite naturally become deep and slow because you are fully aware of each in and out breath. And that awareness of your breath is what makes your breath deep and slow. Because your breath, in those circumstances of mindfulness and concentration, knows exactly what your body needs. And your body needs deep, slow. Your breath, your lungs need deep, slow. So quite naturally, your breathing will will go to deep, slow. And so that is how we practice the, the 16 exercises. We allow our mind quite naturally to go to the next exercise. And uh, then we have the exercise, aware of the whole bodily formation we breathe in, aware of the whole bodily formation we breathe out. Sometimes we think of our body as myself. We think of our body as something that has a core which is me, which is myself. Or we think in a way that there is a me, a myself, outside my body, and it owns my body. We have those natural ways of thinking about the relation between myself and my body, or between mine and my body. But when we breathe in, uh, aware of the whole bodily formation, it's no longer my. That is just a formation. A formation that is made up of so many different things. Samskara made of things coming together. And we just feel that this body is a formation, things coming together, changing at every, at every moment. At every moment there is input, the air coming in the body and other things come to the body. And at every moment there is output, the air going from the body. So the body is now a formation. And when we, uh, and when we come back to that formation of our body, it's the same as when we come back to our breathing. 
our mindfulness will send the message to the body what the body needs. And what it needs most of all is relax. And that is what the that is what our sitting meditation is about. Sitting meditation is to relax, to let go. Calm, ease, smile, release. Sitting meditation isn't uh, making an effort to attain something. It's Rather, the opposite of attainment is letting go of things we've already attained. So the, the next breathing is really about knowing that our body needs relaxing and allowing our, the whole bodily formation to relax to be there, perfectly in the present moment, and relax. In that uh, state of relaxation, it is easier to go on to the next breathing. The next breathing, breathing in, I experience joy. Breathing out, I experience joy. And that joy, where do you experience it? You experience it in your body. Imagine that in every cell of your body, you experience joy. If your body is relaxed like that, then every cell of your body can experience joy. We know that... Uh, Mind and body are not two. So I always say that. I don't say that mind and body are one. <laughs> I say that mind and body are not two. So, mind and body are not two. So really the joy of your, your body is, can be transmitted to the joy of your mind. But it's easier to start with your body, to feel joy in every cell of your body. That is something we have the right to, to feel. Huh? Nobody can tell us you're not allowed to feel joy in your body. Uh, but sometimes in the joy there is uh, some excitement or some fear that you're going to lose it. Sometimes in our meditation we feel the joy and then we think, oh, but maybe I, I won't be able to hold on to it. So joy isn't a hundred percent. But then we have the next uh, exercise. Breathing in, I experience happiness. Breathing out, I experience happiness. And happiness goes deeper than joy. It can also be happiness in every cell of your body. But it's, it's deeper. 
is not something you're afraid of losing because you see that it's uh, deep in your consciousness. So there's no fear of losing, losing it is part of, of your consciousness. Everywhere I look is so beautiful. Look at you, it's very beautiful. Look outside at the sun on the frost is very beautiful. And in front of me, the trees are letting go. They're letting go of the leaves. And the leaves are falling to the ground very, very gracefully without any without any fear because the leaves know that they will come back again in the spring this is something we will talk about in the moment it's to do with the with the characters that we that the sister Nguyen Tung has written on the board for us huh? But we have to come to that a little bit slowly. So now we come back to the, the, the feelings. So the Buddha allows us to feel the, the joy, to feel the happiness in our, our body. But then the Buddha brings us back down to earth. Don't get attached to the happiness and the joy. Because happiness can only be there when unhappiness, happiness and unhappiness, they, they need each other. <laughs> we only have happiness because we, we have unhappiness. So don't ignore the unhappiness. Maybe there is some uh, trace of pain in your body. Although you felt the happiness in your body, maybe there's some trace of pain there. Maybe there's some trace of pain in your mind. So uh, experience that. Huh? You can't have one without the other. And what do we normally do when we experience the unhappiness? We, uh, we tense up a little bit and we want to push it away or run away from it. But now we have the chance. Huh? We can really experience it as it, as it is. And then when we experience it as it is, our mind will do something that is called relaxing the painful feeling or calming the painful feeling. If you give yourself a chance to accept, to face the painful feeling, then the natural thing that follows is that it becomes calm. It becomes relaxed. And that is the, uh, the, the eighth breathing. And I will leave you to discover for yourself the last eight breathing. Of course, you can do that with the help of the commentaries. 
that Thay has uh, written in uh, Breathe You Are Alive is one book and the other is The Path of Emancipation. Do you remember, those of you who've been here for three months, we had a, a memorial, a ancestor memorial day for Master Tang Hoi. And on that day, our sister Hoi Nghiem gave a Dharma talk and talked about the, the breathing, huh? the mindfulness of breathing. We also uh, sang a song on that day, if I remember rightly. Người góp ảo chào. Người góp. Sorry. Người góp. Ảo chào, sorry. I said ảo chào, I said. <laughs> someone who have a European. Huh? <laughs> I meant to say someone who came from my... Chào chào, chào chào, Việt Nam. When uh, Thai was uh, uh, living in Paris, after not being able to go back to Vietnam, Thai had an opportunity to uh, to teach in the university. A called this old practice or something, and also Thai had a an opportunity to use all the libraries uh, in Paris in the university library in the Sorbonne, and because the French had occupied uh, Vietnam, they had brought many uh, Vietnamese texts. Uh, over to France, yeah, from Vietnam. So Thai had an opportunity to read uh, many materials that uh, he, he had not had an opportunity to read before. And in thanks to that, Thai uh, discovered uh, many things about Master Tang Hoi. And uh, that uh, in Vietnam there had been a, a tradition of Zen or Dhyana or Chan, whatever you want to call it, from very, very early times. Uh, before uh, in before in Ch before Bodhidharma in China, and in that tradition of Zen, there was a, a, a un unification of both the what we call the Hinayana or the Theravada and the Mahayana. In these times, in the third century, the Mahayana was only just beginning to, 
to, to, to take shape. And Master Tang Hoi never discriminated between Mahayana and Hinayana. Master Tang Hoi took the sutra of the full awareness of breathing and uh, developed it, but in a Mahayana way. Uh, he called it the, the awareness of breathing, the full awareness of breathing is the Mahayana. And it's a great vehicle that can uh, take living beings across the ocean uh, of uh, birth and death. So we have the, um, the practice of mindful breathing from a very early time in, in, our, in our spiritual tradition. We can say that Master Tang Hoi was the first uh, Zen master in, in Vietnam. And he, he, he wrote uh, uh, and he wrote about the uh, six paramitas and he wrote about the mindfulness of breathing and like we said that he was in Yao Chao <laughs> which is uh, the north of what is now the north of Vietnam and he could have stayed in in Yao Chi, uh, in the monastery there. But he didn't stay there. In uh, 247, he went to the kingdom of Wu. That is, he went to what is now the uh, southern part of China where there had never been any uh, teachings of Buddhism. So he probably went with some other monks. And when he arrived, it was not easy because everybody looked at him as something very strange. They did not know what he was doing and they reported to the, the the king, and uh, the king um, said that uh, he has to, Tang Hoi has to prove that his spiritual path uh, is effective. So uh, they had to uh, practice uh, meditation. He and the other monks had to practice meditation. Uh, in a way that was effective and made the, the king uh, accept them. So, um, the reason I tell you this is because we've been talking about engaged Buddhism and applied Buddhism and we know that uh, the mindfulness of breathing is the way of applying, of applying Buddhism. And we also know that uh, making a journey to, to a place where we will not be accepted is uh, because we want to bring the fruits of our practice to that place. And actually, Tang Hoi was successful he managed to bring the practice to that place so that people could benefit and apply it in their own lives. And so that is the practice of engaged Buddhism. So we go in a historical, a historical order.
So we now go jump for 1,000 years. When I first uh, learned about uh, our uh, spiritual ancestors, when I first came to Plum Village, I always looked at Thai. Whenever I saw Thai, I always saw these spiritual ancestors in Thai. I saw Thai as a continuation of these spiritual ancestors. <clears throat> so we also heard about uh, Master Jan Thai Tom. And uh, Oh, I don't know if we need to tell the whole story over over again. It's a story that always moves people very much. Trantai Tom was a king. And he was caught in a very difficult situation. He had an uncle whose name was Tran. And his uncle was uh, cruel. Yeah, maybe. His uncle was callous, maybe. Mm. He was interested in power. And uh, he wanted the Trun family to be the ruling family. And so he help to <laughs> remove the the Li uh, the Li dynasty that went before. And of course this was not the wish of Chan Tai Tong, but he was put in the position where he had to be king. <coughs> and in a way that uh, was not not ethical. Uh, yeah. And then on top of that, Chan Thai Tom was, at 20 years old, he was married to actually a queen from, uh, from the Li family. And they did not have a child. They did not have a successor. So Chan Thu Do, Opportunity to breathe. Chan <laughs> <laughs> Tudo said, okay, you have to marry the elder sister of your wife. And your wife can just put to one side. Your, yeah. She will no longer be the queen. And... Uh, well, he, he loved his wife, and then he had to marry her elder sister because she was already pregnant. So, uh, by Chan Tai Tom's brother, whom she was married to. <laughs> yeah. So, it was too much suffering. And so, Chan Tai Tom, he decided that he would run away. And he would run away to the mountain where his teacher lived. His teacher was called the Truplam Bamboo Forest. And he would go up there and he would practice and he would stay with his teacher on the mountain. Yeah, because that is a more wholesome life. And so uh, one night he uh, he escaped from the palace and he went up uh, to the mountain. It took more than uh, one night. It took the whole of the next day and the next night because the road is not good. And the horse was very tired. But when he arrived the, and he met uh, the ma his master, uh, Master Bamboo Forest, 
and the master bamboo forest said, what are you doing here? Why have you come here? And uh, so Chan Tai Tong said, I have come looking for the Buddha. I want to become Buddha. I want to become a Buddha. So I have come here to learn how to become a Buddha. And then the bamboo forest master said, Buddha is not found on the mountain. Buddha is found in your own heart. So they must have uh, talked a little bit together. And then what happened? Tran Tu Do, the uncle, uh, with the other members of the court, they arrived on the mountain wanting to take uh, Chan Tai Tong back to the back to the palace to be king. And Chan Tai Tong <coughs> said no. He said no three times to Chan Thu Do. And then Chan Thu Do said, okay, if you won't come back, we will set up our court here. Oh put down his flag, his staff, and said, we'll set up the court here. And then Master Bamboo Forest said, oh, don't let them destroy my mountain. <laughs> mm. and, uh, but, uh, and then uh, one of the member of the Trangkom La Ai, Trangkom La 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 Em, Anyway, one of the royal family, Trang Kong, took Trang uh, Tai Tong aside to talk to him. And uh, he said that, uh, yes, I, I understand that you, uh, you want to practice meditation in, in order to become Buddha, and you want to look after your spiritual life. That is uh, understandable. But uh, what about the people? Have you thought about the people who look on you as their, their father, their mother? The king is the father and mother. And uh, so then Chan Tai Tong began to think. He said, it's okay to realize your own enlightenment, become Buddha on the mountain, but what about your people? And at that point, Chan Tai Tong went to Bamboo Forest Master and said what Chan uh, Kong had said to him. And uh, at that point, this is all recorded uh, by Chan Tai Tong. He wrote in, the, in one of his writings. Huh? He said that uh, Trup Lam took his hand and held his hand and said to him, uh, the king uh, is the, the mother of the, of the people. And the mind of the people, the wishes of the people, are the wishes of the king. The mind of the people the, is the mind of the king. So, so please uh, go back. Go back and, uh, and rule your country. But remember one thing, uh, to study the, the sutras. Uh, don't, uh, don't ever forget to study the, the sutras. And so Chan Tai Tong obeyed and he went back with the, to the palace and he ruled. He ruled, I think, for 30, 32, 32 years, and then he uh, retired. And when he retired, he was able to write uh, many things about his practice of Zen. He practiced very, very successfully. Um, he said that uh, the work of a king is very, very great. And a king has to 
has to study the Confucian texts as well, not only the Buddhist texts. But uh, he did his best to study the Buddhist texts, and he invited meditation masters to come and to show the practice and to discuss the practice with them, because he himself was a meditation master at the same time as being a king. And he wrote a book of the guide, a guide, a manual, uh, manual, ting tom, ting, ting tom, chi nam, something, a, gui- a manual, a guide to, to uh, the Zen school. Mm. And uh, every year, Bamboo Forest Master would come back to the capital once a year only, stay for a short time and go back again. And uh, Chan Thai Tom showed him the book he had written. And he said, oh, the Buddha is in this book. Go ahead and publish it. So now we don't have it anymore. Many Buddhist, uh, Vietnamese Buddhist texts have, were destroyed by the Ming uh, dynasty from China. So, Chan Thai Tom is a real example of applied and engaged uh, Buddhism. Uh, he enjoyed very much the Diamond Sutra. And uh, in the Diamond Sutra there is a Section number 10, there is a, a part that says, um, Give rise to the awakened mind, the bodhicitta, without your mind dwelling anywhere, without dwelling in form, in sound, in smell, in taste, in touch, and thought, yeah. And uh, Chan Thai Tom said that when he came to that page, he had uh, read that, he had a break, a breakthrough. And uh, he put the book down and just enjoyed giving rise to the mind that doesn't dwell anywhere. And this is a little bit connected to the mind that is always, is never satisfied and is always searching for something to, like a, a monkey, huh? searching for a branch to, to hang on to, and it, to hang on to and to dwell there, but not to be searching anymore, just to be as it is in the present moment. So Chan Thai Tong had a grandson who followed in his uh, footsteps. So he knew his grandfather for 20 years. So he must have been born in... It's a king. They did not live long like people live now, but they uh, they lived a completely fulfilled life. So. Uh, Tr- 
Chan Yan Dong knew Chan Tai Dong, his grandfather. And he also ran away when he was 16. He didn't want to be king. Chan Chan Yan Dong didn't want to be king. He ran away. So sometimes the stories, they get a little bit mixed up. But uh, in the case of Chan Nyan Tong, when he ran away, he didn't have a master on the mountain to run to. So he just arrived at a, a temple. And in the temple, the monk, the monk uh, saw him there and thought, he looked very special. Apparently, Chan Nyan Tong, he had a very special countenance. So people were impressed by that, and so the monk brought him something to eat. And then, not long after, uh, his father, who was uh, Chan Tan Tom, uh, came uh, and brought him back to the the palace. Chan Yan Tom had to go to war. At that time, the Mo- Mongols were, were invade, wanted to invade Vietnam. So I think that experience of uh, going to war, having to go to war, was something that probably had a very deep effect on and he decided he was going to become a monk. So he did become a monk. And he, when his, uh, he, he handed the throne on to his son, so his son took over and he became a monk. And uh, he was able to guide his son as a monk. He was able to guide his son in, in ruling the country. Chan Nyan Tom uh, had a very deep uh, practice of um, we can call um, allowing your mind to be completely at ease. Nien được lòng rối chẳng cần phép as long as I don't know the word mind is not quite right to translate <laughs> the Vietnamese lom not quite in English we have the mind we have the heart uh, we sometimes talk about gut feelings <laughs> but uh, yeah we don't really have words to translate as long as your heart, your mind is completely at ease. You don't need any other. You don't need any other practice. And uh, to be able to go and uh, live on the mountain to practice meditation, but at the same time to be able to tour among the people in order to bring the authentic teachings of Buddhism to his people was two things that he managed to combine perfectly. And the teachings of um, the ten uh, we heard about in the Dharma talk from Sister Dinyema, the ten, uh, ten uh, wholesome practices, which are the basis for the 14 mindfulness trainings. Yeah. Because at that time, Buddhism was a little bit uh, caught up with uh, uh, some kinds of Hindu superstition. And another... Uh, deep desire that uh, Chan Nyan Tom had 
was to make peace between, to keep the peace between what was Dai Viet, now Vietnam, and what was south of Dai Viet is Champa, the country of Champa. And he went on foot to Champa in order to to talk to the king of Champa. We also had a Dharma talk uh, about, uh, did we? Oh, we, had, we had a memorial day for Master, uh, Master Nyuk Din. Huh? So over, uh, over there in the, his altar, over there, the ancestral altar. And um, on that memorial day, we heard the, the story of his life or some parts of his life and he uh, as a monk uh, he was a real sangha builder <coughs> he is in uh, in Hue in central Vietnam and he building the sangha of the the monastic sangha but at the same time his insight uh, was appreciated by the king. And the king would ask his advice. He was advisor to the king also. He, uh, he, he was a tireless uh, sangha builder. But at one time he saw that his mother is now very old and, and weak. And uh, he felt that also he did not have, because he, as you see, he did not live too long. He did not have, he was 60 years old at the time. He did not have much longer to live himself. So he wanted to devote his last, uh, his last years to taking care of his mother and uh, really enjoy the fruits of his practice. So he retired to a hermitage, which is now the, which is now the root temple, the Du Hill Temple. Yeah. Loving kindness uh, of uh, filial piety, of the filial piety of loving kindness. So the, the story that we we heard, was that he went. He retired to this hermitage, which he built himself with a couple of, uh, of young monks and his mother. And his mother was not well. And they called the, uh, the doctor. And the doctor said, your mother really needs some more protein uh, than needs to eat some fish. Because monks in, in, in Vietnam, they're always vegetarian. And so he could have asked the lay people, please go and buy some fish. But he didn't. He went to the, the market, a half a day's walk away, and he bought a fish and he carried it back. Didn't put it in a bag so that nobody would see it. He carried it back and everybody was looking. What is a monk doing buying a fish, carrying a fish? And uh, 
so the, the word came to the king. In Hue, it's like that, you know, the word, it goes around very, very, very quickly and everybody knows what everybody else is doing, especially if they're doing something that isn't right. And th then they, uh, so the, uh, the king heard about it and uh, he said, I have to go and ask, what is he doing? Huh? And uh, so he came, uh, he came to the hermitage and at that uh, moment uh, the, the fish soup had already been uh, cooked and was being uh, was, uh, Master Nyaknim was bringing the fish soup to his, uh, his mother and so when the king saw that he, he understood everything that had, had happened uh, Master not buying fish for his himself, but only for his sick mother. So, um, as I said, when I see Thai, I always see these ancestral teachers in, in Thai. And uh, when I read the poem of which Thai wrote and which Sister Jung Kong has uh, sung for us, some of us, uh, this Rain's retreat about the, okay, yeah, the the fish who the fish who is a <laughs> I don't know how to translate this uh, yum tom huh this means the fish who is perfectly interpenetrate a free freely free interpenetration of the fish and it doesn't just mean that that your body will freely interpenetrate, it means that your, your mind is completely free also. Hmm. So when, he, when Master Nyakdin was walking back holding the fish and everybody was like, looking at him, huh? Did he have some kind of meditation? Did he have some kind of uh, looking deeply? And I think that this uh, meditation, uh, is in this poem. which I will now read to you. And then we will hear, uh, hear its song. So we call the, the, the poem is called The F Fish Who Perfectly, uh, Freely Interpenetrates. Hmm. Something like that. And the fish is talking. So the poem is the words of the fish. You are a fisherman. You spread your net over the deep ocean. Your skin is fragrant with ocean salt. Your muscles have curled in the sun. I am a mackerel. My scales glisten. I struggle desperately along with thousands of other fish in the net you spread out. I am lying at death's door in the hold of the boat. You have to kill me in order to make a living. You are a young lady in the market. You hold your bag, you stand and you look. I have already died, but I have not closed my eyes. My flesh is still very 
sorry, my flesh is still very fresh. My gills are still pinkish red. You carry me home, cut me into many pieces, put me in the pan for a warm winter evening meal. Because of me, you and your children have a hot meal. Under the thatched roof, everyone's belly is warm. Can anyone recognize me now? In after, it's gone into the super. Can anyone recognize me now? as my body appears and disappears in the cycle of birth and death. For thousands of lifetimes, I have been a sea fish, a river fish, swimming in and out at ease. We talk about coming in and going out at ease. Here, I say swimming in and swimming out at ease. It means coming into life and going out of life at, at ease, coming in and going out in freedom. A spacious home is sometimes more beautiful than one of jade. My world, this is the world of the ocean, huh? is full of blues, reds, and pinks. And I have learned by heart the lesson of this, and that are not true. The lesson of perfect interpenetration, Jung Tomha, so that every time I fall into the net, I can die at ease, without hate, without despair, because I know death is made of life, being is made of non-being. All species inter are. You and I, Jung Tom, <laughs> you and I blend into each other in freedom. So we now hear the, the poem sung in, uh, in Vietnamese. Có cảm chung không? So we listen to the sound of the bell first. biển sâu kéo lưới nước da em thơm mùi biếng mặn nhưng bắp thịt nem cuồng càng dưới nắng tôi là con cá thu vẫy vì lấp lánh chùa tuyệt vọng cùng với hàng ngàn con cá khác trong lòng lưới em căng tôi nằm hấp hối trên mang thuyền em phải giết tôi vì sự sống của em em cũng là người thiếu phụ ở ngoài chờ sắt gió đứng nhìn tôi đã chết rồi nhưng mắt tôi chưa nhắm 
thịt tôi còn tươi lắm mang tôi vẫn còn đó hồng em mang tôi về chặt tôi ra thành nhiều mảnh bỏ vô nồi bữa cơm chiều ấm áp mùa đông có tôi em và các con em có mâm cơm nóng dưới mái trăn mọi người ấm bụng còn ai nhận được ra tôi nữa khi sắc không ấn hiền xoay vòng một trăm ngàn kiếp làm thân con cá biển cá sông tôi đã vào ra bơi lội thông dòng nhà cửa không gian có khi đẹp hơn là bích ngọc thế giới tôi đầy đủ màu xanh màu đỏ màu hồng và tôi đã học thuộc lòng bài học bí thứ bất nhị bài học chung thông để mỗi khi xa vào lưới được chết thông dòng không hận thù không tuyệt vọng bởi vì tôi biết sự sống làm bằng sự chết cái có làm bằng cái không mọi loài tương tức tôi và em giống thông This is to help us uh, look deeply into uh, no birth and no death. Again, in the, uh, the sutra on the eight realizations of the great beings, we hear that uh, that is our, our career. Our career is to be able to look deeply into what we call birth and death in order to be able to see the interdependent uh, nature and to be able to be free from the, the, the bonds of, of birth and death. This is something that uh, <coughs> our ancestral teachers have all practiced and something that our closest uh, teacher, our root teacher, had also practiced. And I think uh, in the, the life of our, looking at the life of our root teacher of Thai, that we can see this, uh, this uh, what is expressed in this poem. That is the uh, ability to interpenetrate freely with all that, that that is. I remember one time when <coughs> Uh, I was speaking uh, at that time uh, President Bush was the president in the United States and uh, I said that if you call the name Bush I will say yes and if you call the name uh, Saddam Hussein I will say yes so uh, this is a, a very deep practice it's a practice that has been handed on to us and uh, each of us have the, the ability to take it up in our, our hands and, and to see how in our own lives we can have that uh, freedom, that freedom to interpenetrate uh, completely with, uh, with what is not our, what we call not our, not ourselves. And each of us have uh, our own life. 
which is uh, different from each everyone else and each of us has our own way of uh, of realizing the practice of uh, interpenetration but although we all each have our own uh, particular way we do it together as a as a sangha we don't uh, go up onto the mountain to uh, to practice on our own but we we remain with the sangha in order to be a support for the sangha and in order to be supported by the sangha so thank you